Lord. Mr. McKendrick. My Lord, good morning. Um, I appear on behalf of the second uh, uh, appellant, Mr. L.F. Yes. Uh, my learned friend, uh, Ms. Colm, appears for G, the, the mother of the patient. Yes. Here. My learned friend, Mr. Brownhill, appears pro bono for N, G's grandmother, alongside his instructing solicitor, Ms. Kate Jackson, who also appears um, pro bono. Um, yes. My learned friends, Mr. Michael Malonis, Queen's Counsel, and Mr. Olivia Kirkwood. Yes. Appear for the trust in the CCG. Mr. Malonis, I only raise an eyebrow surprise because Ms. Powell's name is on the. My Lord, yes. But you were, you've been in throughout, haven't you? And then Ms. Roper. You're going Ms. To Roper, and Mr. Mr. Ben Harrison for G. Right. All right. Shall we start by just. Can you just remind us the position about the reporting restrictions? Yes. A reporting restriction order was made by His Lordship after the contested hearing in February. So there is one in place, and uh, that provides that uh, G should not be identified, the trust should not be identified, and the care home should not be identified, and nor should the other parties, my so Lord. So for the trust, care home, CCG, or not, I think it's now an ICB, an integrated care board. And other, and uh, yeah, yes, and the other, and the parties, and the witnesses. Ah, my Lord, that's right. Okay, and, and that's we also we need. We, so there's nothing we need to do about that. Uh, my Lord, no. So, we, so just so everybody understands, that continues. Yes. And the publication of any of those names would be a contempt. My Lord, yes. We're being live streamed, of course. We are being live streamed, and I will try to use um, appropriate anonymisation in my submissions. But having um, lived and breathed this uh, case and these proceedings since December, I am. Anxious that I may slip and mention somebody's name. Well, it's, a, it's a hazard for all of us, but let's, Lord, let's, but Lord, hope, yes. all, let's hope we all manage Lord, to yes. avoid it. Yes? Lord, in terms of the timetable, um, I'm going to speak first. Yes, you're going first. About an hour and a half to two hours or so. And then Miss Conn on behalf of the mother. Um, and then Mr. Brownhill on behalf of the grandmother. Yeah. And then Mr. Mylonis and then Miss Roper. And I think so you're any, you said you said you would be how long? About two hours, my lord. Depending so on you're, are you going to well, take the lead on the law on well, the other side? I, I suppose there are a number of different issues in each of the three appeals, but I will certainly spend quite a bit of time on what is the correct test. Injunctive test. The grant of an injunction yep. and how Section 37 applies in the Court of Protection. Okay, so you're going first. Then Ms Cohn, how long is she going to be? About an hour, my lord. Right. Mr Brownhill, about Brown an hour. How long is he going to be? About an hour as well, please, my lord. Uh, okay, all right. Then Mr. Malonis, Lord, about an hour and a half. Okay, well that takes us to the end of the day. Looks so like you'll be tomorrow. Um, yes, I won't be the whole of tomorrow. <laughs> no, because I think so. This is for a day and a half, isn't it? Oh, I thought two uh, two days, my lord. But um, I think the <coughs> appellants do want about one hour in reply. Okay, but all right. So again, how long will you be? Probably about an hour and a half. An hour and a half, and then a replies. Uh, okay, well that's. Finish sometime tomorrow, but not necessarily at 4.15. Well, understood, okay. understood. I, I think, I mean, I may not be two hours this morning, and I think we will comfortably okay. deal with all submissions. In well, they're very full, they're very full uh, written submissions. We've oh, had yes. a good chance to read it, read it. Um, yes. It's familiar territory for some of us, in many respects. Um, then the other issue you've got to do with the respondent's notice. Oh, yes. Uh, Hand over to Mr. Malonis, but I have no observations on, on that, no opposition to... Is there going to be any opposition? I don't think there is any. No, OK. My Lord, yes, unfortunately I have to deal with that. Um, and can I offer my apologies that that wasn't the e-filing, <coughs> that wasn't complied Well, I've seen a very... Um, had a brief chance to read a, an electronic version of a statement by your solicitor, yes. which sets out the background. Uh, I haven't... We haven't talked about it, but I... But um, you're, there's no opposition. Yeah, okay. I think we'll, we'll, we'll allow the respondents notice. Um, I'm grateful to your solicitor for taking the time to, to file that statement. Well, I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. I have asked for some hard copies to be sent over. Those are being brought over from my chair. It's no longer as urgent as perhaps it might have been five minutes ago. Thank you very much. Great. Um, is there any other matter we need to deal with no, in no. advance? No. Okay. All right. Um, I just have uh, one matter to update the court, and that is that G moved to the care home oh. um, around 10 days ago, I don't, the 8, 18th, the 18th of August, my lord. Uh, right. Right. 
Well, can I just set out the structure of my submissions, if I may? Um, first of all, uh, I'm going to deal heavily with the law in my initial submissions. And section one will deal with um, why section 47 of the Mental Capacity Act is the correct and the only test for the grant of an injunction in the Court of Protection, and not section 16. And I will spend some time on the statutory provisions and then look at what is the relatively limited case law that deals with injunctions in the Court of Protection. Yeah. The second uh, section of my submissions is to deal with um, the Section 47 Mental Capacity Act test and Section 37 of the Senior Courts Act and how that should be approached in the context of the Court of Protection and how the wider case law on Section 37 fits in to the statutory scheme of the Mental Capacity Act and the Court of Protection. The third section will deal relatively briefly with um, the weight, the approach of dealing with anonymous hearsay evidence, which is an issue that just only relates to my client's appeal. The fourth section will deal with what in fact was decided by the judge below, what tests did the judge below apply, and why we say that's wrong. Fifth, um, I will deal with the respondent's submission that they say the injunction um, could be granted under either the Section 37 Senior Courts Act test or Section 16, and this court should uh, dismiss the appeal because it could have been made in any event. I'm asking the court to allow the appeal and for the matter to be remitted to be reheard. And my client uh, would offer to this court an undertaking, um, should that be necessary not to act in a rude or abusive manner to any of the staff at the care home. That will be the extent of his undertaking. Um, I, I can flesh it out okay. in, in, in greater detail. Um, I raised that with the judge below that an undertaking could be given in those sorts of terms, but that there wasn't much um, judicial interest in that, uh, the injunction being made, so I didn't really put um, pen to paper to flash out, but it would be of, of that nature, um, uh, my lord. Yeah. Can I then deal with um, the first uh, section, which is um, the law and the power to make injunctions? Uh, and our place on that is relatively straightforward, my lords. We say that section 16.5 of the Mental Capacity Act does not provide the court with a power to make uh, injunctions that must uh, take place through section 47 of the Mental Capacity Act, applying section 37 of the Senior Courts Act. And perhaps it's useful just to walk through some of those statutory provisions first, and if I could invite my lords to pick up the authorities bundle, yeah. and turn to page 20, which is section 47. general powers and effect of orders, etc. The court has in connection with its jurisdiction the same powers, rights, privileges and authority as the High Court. And we say that is the source of the statutory power uh, to grant injunctions. The Senior Courts Act is um, further forward at uh, page 22, but I don't think I need trouble the court looking at the text of that, it being well known. But perhaps I may ask my lords to turn to page 55 just to see what the explanatory note says about section 47. 55. Yes, my lord. <coughs> and 55, my lords, we say is um, helpful in understanding <coughs> section 47 because it says um, subsection 1 gives the Court of Protection the same powers as the High Court, for example, in relation to witnesses, contempt, and enforcement. And we say that enforcement um, adds uh, strength to the statutory interpretation process, which means that section 47 is the appropriate source of the power to grant injunctions. Can I then ask the court please to turn to 
page 14 in section 16. This is one of the core provisions of the Mental Capacity Act, the power to make decisions and appoint deputies um, general. Yes. Section 1 permits, if a person lacks capacity, for the court to make a decision in relation to P's personal welfare or P's property and affairs. And Section 2 makes clear that the court may, by making an order, make the decision or decisions on P's behalf in relation to the matter. And this is the power which the court of protection exercises all the time. Mm -hmm. Day in, day out. Yes. Absolutely. Or the court may decide to appoint a deputy for property and affairs or a deputy for welfare matters. And um, probably the order that the court, I think, makes most frequently is appointing a deputy for property and affairs, often dealt with on the papers. Yeah. But it's the court, the court generally, um, not in the sort of, not at the hearings. Exactly. Which, I think they're often you dealt with. And I appeared in over the years, but, but not yet. Uh, up, up the road as a matter of course. As a matter of course, at First Avenue House, um, these matters are dealt with on the papers routinely. Yeah. Importantly, for the purposes of this appeal, Section 16.3 says, the powers of the court under this section are subject to the provisions of this Act, and in particular to Section 1, the principles and four best interests. We say that's a key provision, because when I take, and my lords, to Sections 1 and 4, it will be seen how the powers in Section 16 must be exercised and they must be exercised in P's best interests. That's a very strong indicator against Section 16.5 being the source of the power for an injunction, because it would be most surprising if Parliament took the view that an injunction should be granted under the test of must be a decision in P's best interests. Yes. So Section 16.3 governs Section 16.5 as well. Yes. Section 16.5 is um, the provision which we took some time debating before his lordship below, uh, and it, it, our submission in respect of that is that Section 16.5 is more likely restricted to the question of um, orders, directions uh, on the deputy, in respect of the deputy. Well, let's look at the, is the syntax. Does the syntax help you there? Punctuation, well, do I perhaps? I think, um, my lord, in our well, submission, not the word you. and, <laughs> the word and uh, indicates that the, the further orders that give such directions and confirm the deputy mean that these are all orders or directions or authorities being conferred on a deputy. If it were otherwise, it would say the court may make such further orders that give such directions or confirm the deputy such powers or impose on him such duties. If, if, somebody, if a statute provision says the court may do a and B. As a matter of ordinary language, that doesn't mean it can only do A and B, it means it can do A and it can do B. So is there any difference grammatically between saying the court may do A and B and saying the court may do A or B or both? Um, Lord, I, I, I see that. As I, as I say, um, the interpretation of 16.5 probably isn't at, at the core it's of your, your, your case on section 37.47 doesn't turn on no, and if I'm wrong on the interpretation of section 16.5, as the judge below found, uh, it, it doesn't affect the overall submission. If you were right on this, it would rule out quite a lot of, of, of ancillary orders, which the courts make day in, day out, wouldn't it? Um, well, there's a number of points to make in respect of that. The court, in making orders under section 16, is making best interest decisions for P. So, why is there a need for us there to be both section 16.2 and section 16.5? Because the section 2 is about orders make, making decisions on P's behalf in relation to matters, and section, subsection 5 is about and matters ancillary to that, which may not strictly be on P's behalf, but are necessary to be made to give effect to those orders under 16.2. Lord, I, I see that, um, and as I say, the, the, the debate I can see can goes, both, goes both ways. If one looks at the explanatory notes, it, 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 it really seems to limit section 16.5 to have we, got, have we got the explanatory notes? We, we do, that's at um, Authority to Bundle 53, my lord. Yeah. 
And you can see um, yeah, okay. on page 53, subsection 5 enables the court to grant the deputy powers and impose duties on him as it thinks necessary to avoid repeated applications to the court. However, it also enables the court to require the deputy to seek consent before taking certain actions. So the explanatory notes add some force to the interpretation that section 16.5 deals with um, powers in respect of the deputy. Is there authority on this interpretation of subsection 5? Um, not, I think, that um, materially assists the court a lot, no. Can I ask you another grammatical, purely syntactical point? A lot, yes. If you look at the end of section 65, it says it may do all, the court may do all these things for the purpose of giving effect to an order or appointment made under subsection 2. And then if you look back at subsection 2, it's divided into A, making an order, or B, making an appointment. So does that not tend to suggest that you could do it either when you're making an order under A or making an appointment under B? My Lord, again, I, I, I see that, and I, I think I'm going to, to move on from my <laughs> submissions, which restrict section 16.5 only to deputies, because the, uh, the syntactical and grammatical uh, arguments may indeed have some force, and the explanatory note may have taken a, a, a narrower... It's not, it's, it's not the critical point for your appeal. My Lord, absolutely not. No. It, what is critical is section 16.3. Yeah. And what is critical is that section 16.5 must um, comply with the provisions of section one and section four. What you're going to, your overall submission is this, is that before an injunction, to make an injunction in these sorts of cases, it is necessary but not sufficient for the best interests test to be satisfied. In other words, if we have, you, an applicant for an injunction has to get over the section, the best interest, has to satisfy best interests, but that by itself is not enough, because there also has to be compliance with the section 47, 47 test. I mean, well, that's right. Okay. Uh, but it, it, it's also, so if, if perhaps we could go to section one, then section okay. four. Section one, and uh, my lord, uh, Lord Justice Baker will know very well, um, are the overarching principles that apply. But the, the key provision is section, subsection one, five, an act done or decision made under this act for on behalf of a person who lacks capacity must be done or made in his best interests. That applies to section 16.5. So if section 16.5 provides the source of the power for an injunction, then it must comply with section 1.5. And that would exclude the interests of the persons who may be the subject of the injunction. And we say is obviously wrong. That point is reinforced, my lords, if one looks at section 4, which is what is sometimes referred to as the statutory checklist for best interests. But it's what guides the court when making a decision in somebody's best interests. And that's as a page nine of the authorities bundle, my lords. And the key provision is subsect, subsection seven. Um, the decision, makes to, decision maker must take into account, if it's practical and appropriate to consult them, the views of the following, which would, for example, be the three appellants who are the subject of the injunction, but that, that is to as to what would be in the person's best interests, and particularly as to the matters mentioned in subsection 6. So the statutory checklist is directing the decision maker to consider the views of others, but only in respect of P's best interests, um, not their wider rights and responsibilities. Thank you, ma'am. And I'm not quite following why the best interests test um, would rule out an injunction. So presumably that when the court is making an order under 16.2, um, it must plainly consider the best interests of the person. But then 16.5 gives a power to make for further order or direction. And, and if it is expedient um, to grant an injunction to give effect to the court's order, is made in the best interest of P. I, I don't see why there's any difficulty with that, but in considering whether it is expedient, the court would have to take into account the same considerations it would always take into account when considering making an injunction. But the, the, my Lord, the, we would say the answer to that is in section 1.5, which requires the decision, which would be the injunction under section 16.5, a decision made 
must be done or made in his best interests. So the injunction must be made in his best interests under section 16.5. But it would be because you you would have you would only be um, you would only be uh, making the order under 16.2 in the best interest. So the so the further order you're making, um, it, it, it's a given that it's to enforce the order which is made in the best interest. I'm not sure why there's a problem with that. Because the, the requirement in section 1.5 that the injunction must be made in peace best interest does not provide sufficient scope to consider the rights of those who might be affected by the terms of the injunction. The just and convenient test considers the range of rights, including the rights of those the subject of an injunction. If one proceeds on the basis of section 16.5, section 1.5 mandates that an injunction must be in his best interests and must consider the section 4 factors, which do not include the rights of those the subject of the injunction. So, so you, your point is that, that if it was in his he's best interests to grant an injunction, the court would have to do it. The Lord, yes. And, but the sections that's a, one. That's a very um, <coughs> draconian reading of, of the provisions, isn't it? I, I think, my Lord. Might, it might be in the best interests, it might be in somebody's best interests that, uh, that all sorts of things uh, are done, including an order that somebody do pay them a million pounds. Or well, local authority provides unlimited care to P as we know, is not the law. Um, no, that's right. But the, the court, in applying sections 1, 5, and section 4, and section 16, is only choosing, as we know, from the, the available options. So, for example, if, the local, if, if there was a, a, a requirement for, if a court makes a decision that there should be supervised contact in peace best interests, that would be the best interest decision. There would then be the question of who pays for supervision, and that would be an administrative court issue. And if the work was then to be supervision, the local authority can fund that, determining the, 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 determining the rights of the authority. And if there's then to be an injunction requiring contact only to take place with supervision, then that would have to consider the rights of those the subject of the injunction, which sections 1.5 and section 4 don't do. I mean, section one five. I mean, uh, this maybe we don't. Maybe we don't need to go down this. But section oh, yes. one five doesn't oblige decision makers to do things in P's best interest. It only obliges decision makers when they make it do something or make a decision to do it in the best interest. Do you see the distinction I'm? I understand that, Lord. But the the decision made would be the injunction under section 16.5. And that decision must be done or made in P's best interests. I'm struggling to understand the, the point, I must say. There's no, there's no requirement here that the court must do something if it is in his best interests. Uh, no, no uh, but the my understanding of my submission in respect of sections one and four is that the factors are set out in the act, and those are the factors that must be considered to arrive at the best interest decision. And that doesn't appropriately consider the rights of those who might be the subject of the injunction. It would also, it would also my Lord, standing back more widely, be surprising that Parliament said there are two sources of the power to make an injunction. One, just and convenient, by way of section 47 of the MCA and section 37 of the Senior Courts Act, but separately the much lower test of expedient, so in section 16.5. Is expedient a lower test? It, it doesn't capture the, the subtlety of the just and convenient test as set out in the case law which I will come to when I get to stage two. Can I ask you a different question? Does Lord, the yes. court 
protection subject to an overriding objective? The court of protection rules are, um, the Lord, yes. And are, is that in similar terms to the CPR overriding objective? Um, I think it's in very broadly similar terms, but there are, I think there are some differences, my Lord. Because the very essence of the overriding objective is the obligation to deal with the cases justly. My Lord, yes. Which informs the exercise of all the court's powers where it's given discretion. The ability to attach ancillary orders of directions under Section 16.5, when, once you've made a, a decision in relation to one of the 16.2 matters, is a discretionary power vested in the court to give effect, to express it, to give effect, to make the order effective. Yes. Why is that not subject to the obligation to deal with cases justly imported by the overriding objective? And why does the obligation to deal with cases justly require the court not only to have regard whether something is or is not in the best interests of the patient, which Section 1 and Section 4 require the court to do, but also to have regard to more general considerations of justice, which would include the impact of any order on any other person. My Lord, the, 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 the welfare courts, more, more broadly, have often made a distinction between what is just and what is in someone's best interests. Uh, and the courts have observed in a number of occasions, for example, a case management decision, the touchstone of that is justice. Yes. Um, but a, a decision in respect of a, an adult's welfare, the child's welfare under the Children Act, is best interests, which may not be the same as justice. There are statutory checklists or provisions, mm -hmm. section one and four, under the Mental Capacity Act, um, different provisions under the Children Act, which dictate what the outcome will be in somebody's best interests, and they're not always the same, my lord. I I see that, and I see that the primary effect of section sixteen is in section sixteen two, which gives the court. Let's leave aside the deputy because we're not dealing with the deputy. My lord, yes. Case, gives the court power to make orders in relation to peace, in relation to the matters, either peace welfare or peace. My lord, yes. Property. We're only dealing with welfare. So, so for, for present purposes, Section 16.2 requires the court to consider whether to make an order in relation to these welfare. And I think we all accept that for those purposes, Section 1 and 4, tell the court what to have in, in mind when making that decision. Lord, yes. But Section 16.5 is not a primary power. It's an ancillary power. It's a power to make orders or give directions to make that primary order effective, that looks much more like a, a case management type decision. It's, it's much more, how do I make sure that, that the decision I've made under section 16.2 works in the real world? And, and, and that looks like a much more discretionary or ancillary or case management power. Now, you're going to tell me I'm wrong, but at the moment, I, I don't see well, why the, that's wrong. I, I understand all of that. But section 16.5 is still subject to sections 1 and 4. Well, I, I agree. I think we're all agreed. That the court couldn't, under section 16.5, do something knowing that it wasn't in P's best interest. It's all got to be fit within that, that criterion. But I think picking up what my Lord Lord Justice Phillips yes. suggested doesn't necessarily follow that that's the only consideration. Because your submission is. When you're dealing with a best interest decision, all other considerations, because they're not in the checklist in section four, including the rights of the person restrained, if it's an injunction, are to be ignored. And that seems quite a stark submission. And, and for my part, I'm, I'm having some difficulty in accepting it. Um, perhaps I can set it out this way. Um, uh, for example, there would be a decision in respect of a P regarding contact. A best interest decision would be made. That is, a P's best interest to have contact with X but not Y. And then the ancillary provisions in Section 16.5 may well deal with supervision. Um, again, that is that must be in the contact must be in P's best interest. The ancillary provision regarding, for example, supervision must be in P's best interests. But then if there's a requirement to enforce an injunction to prevent another person uh, um, 
coming within uh, the close proximity of P, the test is no longer best interests. The test, we say, is just and convenient, and it should be exercised by way of section 47 and 37. And, and there are clear distinctions, and, and Parliament has set those out by way of section 16.5 and section 47 of the Mental Capacity Act. Another way of considering it is if section 16.5 does provide the power for there to be an injunction, a reporting restriction order could be made only on the basis that it's expedient. And it must be in P's best interest, but in my submission, that doesn't properly permit the court to consider the Article 10 rights, for example, of the press. There is a difference between the Article 8 and an Article 10 Balancing Act and the best interest decision. So when considering whether to make a reporting restriction, does the court take into account the Article 10 rights of the press or not? It must do, yes, my lord. And it should do so by way of section 37, not section 16.5. But the Human Rights Act applies to every decision made by a public authority, including a court. So whether it was acting under section 16.5 or section 37, it would be banned to give effect to the Article 10 rights of those affected, would it not? What I'm having difficulty with, Mr. Lord, Kendrick, yes. I, I, I understand your argument, which is best interest is one thing, just and convenient is something different. Lord, and, yes. and, and you say the problem with best interests is it doesn't take account of the rights of others. <coughs> what I'm having difficulty with is the notion that a court could sort of put blinkers on and say, well, viewed in isolation, this is in P's best interest, so I can do it, and that and ignoring the rights of others. And I, I'd be very surprised if courts, including the Court of Protection, sort of act in, in that way, uh, or could properly think that was a way to act. Any decision the court is going to make is going to take account of not only P's interests, but also what, what the practical effect is and what the legal effect is and the convention rights of other persons, is it not? I understand that, my lord. The, the fallback submission I have then, if, if that is the case, is that Parliament has set out uh, through section 47 of the MCA that the enforcement provisions of the Mental Capacity Act should be exercised in that way, which leads one to section 37 in just and convenience. And Parliament has not set out that Section 16.5 deals with enforcement in the same way because the ancillary best interest orders are not the same as enforcement by way of an injunction. What, what, what as I understand it, is the, is the roadmap of your argument is that you say that the, if read literally, that the power to make an order under 16.5 would give a power to do anything in P's best interest. So therefore, you say, it cannot include the power to grant an injunction. Well, no, that's right, because it doesn't properly account for yes. the rights of others in the way just and convenient does. But that would be to read down the provision to say that, to say that a power which on the face of it would be an ordinary power of the court to give effect to an order it's making should be read as not existing at all, and you say that you say that well then you go off to another provision to look at the power to grant an injunction, but wouldn't as a matter of normal matter of statutory interpretation, rather than reading a provi provision down completely, so as to say that despite the um, the power to make further orders as a necessary expedient, rather than saying that that doesn't extend to injunction. Surely that what you would do is you would read it to say, well, it does extend to injunctions, but it has to be it has to be read as being no as extending no further than you than the court could grant an injunction pursuant to section forty seven. This is a very what I'm saying it's a very extreme instruction that you're raising. I, I, I wouldn't characterise it as, as extreme. Um, I think what we're trying to do is set out that Parliament has set out 
different statutory provisions which have different tests or different purposes. Well, we'll come back to whether it's a different test or not. Yes. And I, I'm not sure, for my part, I'm not sure I accept that it is a different test. Uh, but look, I, I, I certainly um, but, but I understand that. At the moment, as I understand it, um, you're, you're really, it's a sort of, it's almost a little interorum argument, which is, well, because this power could be, would have to be used in a way which would infringe the rights of third parties, there can be no power at all. The Lord, um, I, I can see the way that, that, that it's characterised in that way. Well, if you're wrong, you're saying there is no power under that subsection to grant an injunction. And there's no power under section 16.5 to grant an injunction. No. There, there are ancillary orders that can be made, like supervision, or, or even quite significant steps. Um, for example, uh, a previous case I was involved in, uh, P was incapacitated and heavily pregnant in her own home, and the judge made a section 16.5 order that force could be used to get into the home. But that was a best interest decision that the force was necessary to get into the home. If it had been somebody else's home, then there would have to be consideration of just and convenient under section 47 and 37. That, that's, that's the argument, my lord. And it may well be I'm placing too much emphasis on expedient being different from just and convenient. Yes. Well, you're going to come back to that, I think, aren't you? Um, I need, for my part, I need some convincing that convenient and expedient are different. I mean, the. the the, the distinction would be, my lord, that if one looks at the case law on just and convenient, that there is a rich tapestry to what that means, and I'll take, my lords, to um, G, Spry, and, and some of the other leading authorities. Um, section 16.5, I say, um, means that expedient must have the requirement of being a decision in P's best interests, and, and there isn't necessarily the same overlap. Just going back to the... Um the rules, my lord, yes. The rules. Um, not being able to remember rule one, perhaps I ought to now. It's a long time since I sat in court. Um, I've asked for 2020 edition of the Blue Book Order, and there is an overriding objective, of course, and it is in very similar, yes. as you say, terms to the overriding objective in the CPR and, for that matter, the FPR. Um, and it, the overriding objective is to enabling, enabling the court to deal with the case justly and in proportion to cost having regard to the principles contained in the Act. Yes. And then under sub rule well, 113, it, it, it defines dealing with a case justly in terms which are similar to but slightly different from what's in the CPR. But justly is at, at the forefront of the of these rules as it is in the CPR. So the Lord's point is right, isn't it? That in, in exercising any of these court has to abide by the principles of justice, as one would expect. Um, that depends, my lord, whether it applies to case management decisions, which, which I say it does, absolutely, but also to substantive decisions. It's, it's difficult to think of an example, but I will be thinking about one during the course of the appeal, of a decision that is in peace best interest, but is unjust. But it is, it is possible. Because the case management overriding provision deals with case management decisions, directions, not necessarily substantive best interest decisions, which must be determined by the application of sections 1 and 4 and 16. And that's the importance of just and convenient. That you could have an unjust best interest decision but section 47 is there to provide for the protection of others because just and convenient takes into account wider factors than an unjust best interest decision might make. Did we cover this in the appeal last year from Mr Justice Hayden about the, the party who was dismissed as a party without notice? That's, that's, that, um, it, it, it was, I think, covered. Um, and certainly when the matter went back before Mrs Justice Leave and I appeared for the, the party who had been ejected from the proceedings Very for Mr good. Justice Hayden and restored by my Lord, and we did have the debate in that uh, hearing 
as to what the appropriate test was for the removal of a party in the Court of Protection. And my submission, based on a judgment from Lord Justice Peter Jackson, was the test was justice, not best interests. But I, I'm not sure that found, that argument found too much favour. Okay. Um, uh, well, that's a, that, that's a side avenue we might explore. But anyway, yes. back to your argument, Mr. Uh, Kendrick. My Lord, yes. Um, a large part of the case that it's advanced is that um, injunctive powers can be provided for by way of Section 16.5 because of the reference to the prohibition in Section 17. And if I can ask my lords to turn to page 18. We have Section 17. Now, Section 17 is subject to Section 16, Section 4, and Section 1, and is, if you like, a, a non exhaustive list of examples of personal welfare decisions. And the point is made that 17.1c says making an order prohibiting a named person from having contact with P, and is said to be um, a, a, a form of injunction which reads back to Section 16.5 to strengthen that interpretation. And my submission on that is as follows that a person, a capacitous person, can prohibit another person from having contact with them. You can remove, remove yourself from a situation, refuse to uh, speak on the telephone, or engage in correspondence. That is having contact. A and that is a best interest decision that the court can make. But if you needed the protection of an injunction, and for example, you wished a provision that said, a person shall not come within 50 metres, that is not a provision we say that could be made under section 17 or section 16 properly. That should be made under section 47 and 37, which would then properly take into account the rights of the person being injuncted not to come within 50 metres of P. But could a court make an order prohibiting your client from having contact with P in this case? That could under, be under 17. One C. It, it could be made, my lord, yes. It wasn't made, but it could be made. There right. seems to be there's, there's, a, there's a range of options. The court might make a section 16 decision and say, in somebody's best interest to have contact, and the court might go further and say, I'm going to make an order in someone's best interest that there, sh there shall be no contact and it's prohibited with a named person. Then the court can go to a third stage by way of section 47 and make an injunction saying, you must not come within 50 metres. What's the difference between an order prohibiting and an injunction prohibiting? Isn't, that, isn't an injunction just a different name for an order prohibiting? Um, um, well, that, that is a decision that P can make themselves, and, that, and the test applying a prohibition in Section 17.1c is, is pure best interests. Can the, I, you, you say yes. a capacitous person could prohibit someone else from having contact with them. But is that really the case? So if, if, I'm, if I'm a capacitous person, and I say, I don't want X to have any more contact with me. So I, I say to X, I don't want you to have any more contact with me. And X the next day sends me a, a letter. X has contacted me. The fact that I haven't responded to the letter doesn't, doesn't mean that X hasn't contacted me. It means my prohibition has been of no effect. You've ignored it. But a court can, under Section 171C, say to X, you shall not send a letter to the patient. And if, if X sends a letter to the patient, it's in breach of the order. And so uh, th there is a difference between what a court can do under Section 16 and 17 and what a, a purely capacitous person can do in private life. Is there not? Um, Lord, yes, I, I, I see that. Um, I, I'm placing an interpretation of contact that is a, is a bit wider, meaning really probably in-person contact. Rather but it's, than... it's, it's very often when you get non-contact orders that what you're trying to stop is unwanted attention. Mm -hmm. Hence, don't come within 50 metres yes. of me, don't send me letters, don't send me birthday cards, etc., which require no response from the person who's being protected. It, it's the actions of the person prohibited that, that the court is trying to stop. So I, I think your, your attempt to say, a capacitous person could prohibit contact, and the court's just doing the same as that. It's, it's not 
Well, I'm not persuaded by it at the moment. But I would understand. The, the other way of looking at it is this, that um, if a court is going to make a decision saying you must not, you know, a zonal injunction, which yep. often made in the family courts and elsewhere, you must not come within, on these particular streets or within yep. 50 yards of a place of work or home, the court must consider, certainly at the return hearing, the rights of the person being injunctive. I, I, I don't have any difficulty with that. I'm, I'm picking up what my Lord Justice Phillips said. Yes. I, I'm not sure it, that it, in the end, matters very much where the source of the power well, I is, think I, is found. I, mean, I have your submissions yes. on that, but, but, but I think I remain to be persuaded that it really makes all that much difference. Well, I, I think I, 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 I just run back to the submission yes. I've made, which is that the test is best interests, and that's different from just inconvenient, but I don't, I don't think yeah, repeating no, I that think is going to help. Yeah. Yeah. I, my answer is, you, you've taken us quite, quite properly to 17.1c, to show us the argument you're, you're facing. And Lord, yes. You sort of explain that away. If you're wrong, if your explanation is wrong, and 17.1c is an express recognition that the court can grant an injunction against a third party, do you accept that that does knock a hole in your, your argument in relation to 16.5? Maybe, maybe, a, maybe a, a big hole below the waterline. I, uh, I would I would come back to the the parallel submission, which would be that it's surprising that Parliament has said enforcement is by way of section forty seven, yeah. uh, but an injunction can be made under section seventeen one c under what I submit is the lower test of simply expediency. That doesn't seem to be an answer to my question. <laughs> it's probably the best answer I have at this stage, my lord. And I'm going to think further about about that point. But well, yeah, that, that this argument is raised against. You. Show that you're wrong. Oh, Lord, yes. Uh, and I think what I'm asking you is if, if, if the argument is a good one, do you accept you're wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I need to think of a, a more convincing answer that I've given thus far to show that I wouldn't be wrong, my Lord, and I will think about that. But uh, I can see the dangers from my submission of that point, um, which I think is. I probably should come closer to directly answering the question, Lord, but that's... that's I mean, 71C is more than 71B, isn't it? My Lord, yes. So, what's 71C doing there, if you're right? It, 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 it's, 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 it's going a stage further. Um, 71C <laughs> would... It is the, it's 71C would be a section 16 to order the 1Cs very frequently in the court of protection. It's in the best interest of Peter, contact with their family. But in respect of a named person, um, the, the court can prohibit someone purely in Peter's best interests from having contact. Could a penal notice be attached to that order? Mm. I've got the book here. <laughs> I mean, that would, if, if it could, um, what would the impact be then? I'd be surprised if it couldn't. I, I, I um, uh, uh, my lord, that's a very good question, and, and I can't see why a penal notice couldn't be attached. If it's a penal notice attached to an order prohibiting somebody from doing something, what's the difference between that and an injunction? If I, I simply go back to the argument I made before that best interest may not properly encompass the rights of others, so the subject of an injunction. Just inconvenient is wider. But I, I think I made that point. Um, but that, that's my submission on section 17, um, 1C. The, the, the further point I make is this, that it, it could be said that if section 16, 5, considering the question of expediency, should consider the rights of others, then that has the effect of diluting the importance of the best interest framework for all Section 16 orders. So if the court is considering a Section 16 2 order, it focuses on P, Section 1 and Section 4. It doesn't have to have regard to the legal rights of anybody else. But if that interpretation is correct in Section 16 5, then that would necessarily imply, in my submission, that the court would be required to consider other people, section 16.2. And it doesn't. 
And Section 4 doesn't say that. So if it's right, it has the, the effect of weakening the court's focus and attention on P and P's best interests as directed by Section 1, 5, and 4. I'm sure you're, you're, all these decisions take into account the interests of other people, not, not least the interests of, of um, the public generally and taxpayers. Well, my lord, in my submission, they, they, they don't, because, they, for example, my example of a local authority funding supervision of contact, that's not a question for the Code of Protection, that's a question for the Administrative Court. And if the Administrative Court says lawfully, the local authority must fund it, then whether that supervised contact should or shouldn't take place is a pure best interest question focused on P and Section 4, not the rights of others. Can I, can I give an example, a rather different type of example? Under Section 16.2, court can make decisions about these property. Suppose P, as must very often be the case, is a co-owner of a, of a house. Um, and um, owns it equally with another person. Or the other person is Clastus and is living there. If you simply looked at P's own interests, it might be in P's interest to sell the house so that P would have the benefit of his half share of, of the equity in the property. Are you saying that in making that decision, the Court of Protection would ignore the rights of the co owner who is living in the house? That would seem a very odd way of giving effect to Parliament's intentions. And the, the, the court could only consider the, that, the property question if it were an available option. So if there was implacable opposition from the, the other person who owns the property, then that is not a decision that P could take to sell the property, and therefore it wouldn't come before the court for that best interest analysis. If it is a decision that is open, and lawful, then it comes to the Court of Protection. Suppose P is the sole owner of the property, so is in a position to sell the property. But there are minor children living in the house, together with P's ex-partner. Would the Court of Protection say, well, it's in P's interest to sell the house, I'm going to ignore the right? Cohabity and the, and the children. And if the children's rights were protected in law, which I think would be likely, then again that wouldn't be an available option for P. It wouldn't be a matter that would come before the Court of Protection. If, if the children had rights and, and objected, then there isn't an available property option for, for P. The other way of looking at it, for example, in the property context, is the statutory will. Um, that focuses again on Section 4. And P's best interests. But nobody has rights to have a will made in their favour. People have expectations. But subject to the inheritance provision for Family and Dependents Act, a, a capacitous person and an incapacitous person could leave property anywhere. Well, Lord, yes, it, it would be pure best interests, which doesn't involve or entail the rights of other people. But if the respondents are correct in their, their, in their interpretation of section 16.5 and the test of expediency requires considering the rights of others, then my submission is that's weakening the section 16 focus, which goes back to sections 1 and 4, which wouldn't be consistent with what Parliament say. Thank you. Thank you, my lord. Uh, the, the, the point is raised in um, one of the uh, skeleton arguments of what my Lord, um, Lord Justice Baker said in the Court of Appeal in JB about the Court of Protection sitting in a wider context, in a wider justice system. Mm. Um, that's in the official solicitor skeleton, uh, paragraph 49. But section four does not deal with the rights of others in that way. And in my submission, my Lord, Lord Justice Baker's comments in JB, paragraph six, which Lord Stevens quotes in JB in the Supreme Court, are all said in the context of capacity issues and the rights of others forming part of the relevant information in Section 3 of the Mental Capacity Act. But we're not concerned with that 
in this issue because we're concerned with sections 1 and 4 and best interests. There is very limited case law on injunctions, but it might be helpful just to look at two. <coughs> and uh, the first is the decision of W&M, 2012, Weekly Law Report 287, a decision of my Lord Lord Justice Baker, and that's at 965 of the authority bundle. Do you know which tab? We've got I think it's in three, three isn't it? My Lord, I will bring up the tab in just a, a second. Is 38. 38, thank you. Um, this isn't the main judgment, is it? This is, the this is reporting restrictions, my lord. Yeah, subset, yeah. And my lord proceeds at paragraph 21, at page 965. It's, it's, it's indicated in the text, paragraph 21, to make the injunction pursuant to section 47.1. Now, we, we, my, my simple submission is my Lord was right. That was entirely the right approach to take, and it would have been wrong, the reasons I already explained, to have made a reporting restriction injunction by way of section 16.5. We also have a decision of Mr. Justice. I'm sorry, which was the, par which was the paragraph you were 21, my lord, 21. on 965. It's, it's, yes. it's marked up on the side. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a decision called in the matter of SF 2020 EW Prop 49, and that's at page 1103. I'll try and bring up the tab. Um, tab 45. And this is a decision of Mr. Justice Keane, in which he considers the question of does, can the court make injunctions, and he concludes that the court can. And he sets out his conclusions at the end of the judgment, um, at the bottom of page 1114, paragraph 33, which is also marked up for my lawyers. I raise that because it, there isn't very much authority on this issue, but uh, Mr. Justice Keane's analysis very much accords, I think, with what I'm hearing from my lords in exchanges, that there's a range of powers in through section 47 and section 16.5. Um, he doesn't provide very much reasoning, but my respectful submission is that is wrong for the reasons that I've already given and I'm not going to repeat and that my Lord Lord Justice Baker, when considering the question of an injunction, looking at it only by way of section 47, is correct. So he's effectively saying that the power under section 47.1 is coterminous with the power under section 47. My Lord, yes. Reflected in. My Lord, yes. Uh, no. I don't remember the extent to which this point was argued in M, it's a long time ago since M. And you're um, yes. at, I imagine it was. A, I can find that out. I can find out. I can find get hold of the submissions somewhere on my machine. But um, I wonder whether it was argued. I, 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 I haven't really picked up from the rest of the decision, my lord. But again, the it would be natural in my submission to go to section forty-seven because it leads into the powers of the High Court, Section 37, and questions of enforcement, which are injunctions which cater for the wider interests of the principal way of Article 10, rather than being taken down the route of Section 1, 5, and 4, which is a much narrower test. If you... If the true analysis were that Section 16.5 does enable the court to make orders, including orders in the form of injunctions, 
But, but in doing so, it should take into account similar considerations to those that would take into account, any court would take into account when exercising a power to grant injunctions under Section 37. That would be sufficient for your purposes, would it? Up to a point, my lord, but the, 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 the difficulty with that is that if the court interprets Section 16.5 in that way, what is, what is the principal reason for not interpreting Section 16.2 in that way, which in my submission is then diluting Parliament's focus yes, I see. on the Section 4 best interest test? Yeah. Because Section 1 and Section 4 apply to all of the Section 16 decisions. And if you bring the rights of others in through Section 16.5 in expediency, then there's no principled reason why that should be excluded at Section 16.2. And that's why... But yes, but Section 16.2 is not about granting injunctions, is it? It's about making decisions, my lord, yes. in, in peace best interests. Yes, I see. That Section 16.5 is also about making um, ancillary decisions. I feel I probably should move on because I'm still in section section one. The, the only further submission I make, my lords, is that there's reference in some of the respondents' skeleton arguments to analogous jurisdictions or different jurisdictions. For example, um, the family courts in the inherent jurisdiction. Um, my simple submission on that is it provides very little assistance to this court because Parliament has set out in clear terms the statutory powers of the Court of Protection. And the court needn't go further than look at section 47 and then on to section 37. And it's of no assistance in interpreting section 47 or indeed section 16.5 to look at the Family Law Act and non molestation injunctions or to look at the very extensive case law in the inherent jurisdiction. Before you. Well, I guess. 16.2. Um, 16.2a is. And, and B, if that matters, is only concerned with the court or the. Making decisions on P's behalf. Yes. So uh, I don't see any difficulty. I don't see how the application of the best interest principle in, in relation to 16.2 is in any way subverted by the uh, a reading of 16.5, which requires the court, when it makes a, an ancillary order, um, which is expedient for giving effect to 16.2, to take into account the broader considerations which arise if injuncting a third party. I, I don't see why that, why that, you can say, require, would reflect back onto 16.2 and in some way say, when you're making a decision on P's behalf, you do, you do so with the interest of third parties. But I, I, I understand the point. I, I think all I can say in response is that um, the Section 16.5 ancillary decisions are, are still decisions which must be subject to the Section 1 principles and the best interest principles. And therefore, there is that risk that if the section, the wider the, the respondent's interpretation of section 16.5 is correct, then section 16.2 decisions will be weakened because they are both subject to section 1.5 and section 4. Well, let's, let's imagine that there's a, a fund of money which is held on behalf of P by a third party. And the courts decide that it would be in his best interest, P's best interest, that that fund is held by somebody else. That makes the decision on behalf of P that fund should be uh, um, should now be held not by um, X but by Y. Now that that is, that is the decision under 16.2, but it might be necessary, depending on the position of X, to order X to transfer the money to Y. And it seems to me that that would be a perfectly sensible ancillary order under 16.5, but that would be an order against X. And it seems to me nothing wrong in ordering X to transfer the money to Y. But that obviously is a, an order which affects X, because he holds the money and um, an injuncting somebody requiring them to make a transfer of money is an order which has to respect 
they're right. But I don't, see, I don't see why there's any difficulty with that. And it seems to me it's exactly the sort of thing that 16.5 is there for. Um, I understand the logic. Um, I, th I think I just, I simply come back to. And similarly, if you decide in these interests that they should move from facility A to facility B, um, and a third party is seeking to uh, impede that transfer, as the court has decided, uh, uh, is a decision that should be made to be in their best interest. I don't see why the court shouldn't injunct that third party from impeding the transfer, whether it's by blocking the road or by seeking to subvert the offer from the third party. It's, it's exactly the same principle. Does the requiring X transfer the money? You, you make an ancillary order to give effect to the best interest. But the ancillary order is still a best interest decision. Well, it, it, it's, it, is, it, is, it is made on the hypothesis that you've already decided that the order you're making is in the best interest. Then you have to make ancillary orders against third parties to give effect to that decision because a third party is impeding it. Now, it's, it's perfectly well established that the court has jurisdiction to make orders to give effect its other decisions, and whether that's under Section 37 or, or um, that's the inherent jurisdiction, or expressly under 16.5, I don't see why it matters. Uh, it, it, no doubt it's, it's my over-interpretation on the subtlety complexity of just and convenient and, and the extensive case law on it, which does not mirror or match, in my submission, simple expediency under the requirements of section 1.5 and section 4 which don't sufficiently capture the rights of others. Thank you. Yes, hello. Yes. So, um, other jurisdictions are, are not of uh, much assistance uh, in interpreting the Mental Capacity Act. Um, can I then move on to um, the next section which is section 37. Uh, and the overarching submission with respect to that is um, it, it, it isn't um, easy to define exactly how the Section 37 just and convenient powers should apply in the Court of Protection, uh, and they are obviously deliberately broad. Um, and, and I correctly adopt what my Lord and Lord Justice Nugie says in Holly Open Candy, um, paragraph 8.1, no need to turn it up, Authority Bundle 1031 that while section 37 is broad, it's, it's not completely unfettered. That now has to be read with the comprehensive analysis in the Privy Council by Lord Leggett, which is the latest pronouncement. Technically, it's not binding on us, but my inclination would be to s adopt what he said as being the, the, the latest statement of the law. Well, I, I find myself uh, agreeing with what my Lord says. Yes. In, in Hollyoaks, so if there's a further refinement of development which in any way changes broad but not completely unfettered, then uh, again we, we, we would agree and adopt with that, my lord. Um, but it, it creates more of a framework for the protection of rights of others, uh, and that's the important point that, that we stress. Um, I, think, I think what Lord Leggett said is there isn't actually a fetter in the statute, but these things have to be injunctions are granted in accordance with principle. But, Lord, yes. but, but the principles aren't to be pigeonholed into, I mean, some of the earlier cases said you can do it for X or Y or Z. And he says that's that's too, too restrictive an approach. Yes. Of course it has to be done in accordance with principle, but when, in that particular case, it was a freezing injunction, freezing injunctions are granted in, in aid of a court's enforcement of, of judgments, and, that, and that's a sufficient reason for doing it. You don't need to find a legal or equitable right. You, you can do yes. it in support of your right to have your judgments effective. And it seems to me, speaking for myself, that injunctions granted in the Court of Protection can also be granted to make their other orders effective. Well, no, certainly um, the, the submission I made below that there had to be the identification of a legal electoral right. I, I don't pursue in my written argument. I accept it's legal electoral right or, or, or other broad right. 
and indeed um, Spry, um, which is again Authorities Bundle 1181, but maybe not important to turn it up, very helpfully sets out that there are rights in equity, but there are also uh, a broad category of cases where an injunction would be granted in accordance with the principles of equity, yes. rather than to give effect to an equitable principle. Uh, and that seems to me to be a, a very helpful description, which, does, which avoids the categorization that some of the cases have provided. There's a basic principle. Lord, yes. And complied with. Lord, yes. But the, the, the Court of Protection judge applying, well, considering an application for an injunction made by, in reliance on Section 47, does need to have in mind those principles and approach them as, as is summarised by Spry or, 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 or indeed G uh, and the reference in the authorities bundle is 1179 for the helpful summary of G. Those are questions of principle that the court must consider. And that, in my submission, is different from the section um, 16.5 reference to it must be in best interest by way of section 1 and section 4. And I also rely on the observations of, again, by Lord Lord Justice Nugent in the B Children Police Injunction case, where my Lord. Uh, uh, so that's Authorities Bundle 851, and the neutral citation is 2022 EWCA CIV 9A2. That, in terms of procedural matters, that is a case in the context of the family division, that the, the provisions um, which apply in the other divisions apply equally. And, uh, and we would say, again, apply equally in the Court of Protection. There must be both a, a, the search for principle in granting an injunction and uh, a compliance with the procedural requirements of granting one. And, and my Lord, Lord Justice Nugent is, is focusing in that ex parte case on, on, on the practicalities, the procedures, but we say the same application of the principles applies in the Court of Protection. I don't think I need to say any, any more on Section 37. Turning then to the question of um, anonymous evidence, um, the court will be very familiar with the Civil Evidence Act in Section 4, and that's at the authorities bundle at Section 49. And I've also referenced, it's quite difficult to find any significant authority on the question of anonymous uh, hearsay evidence. May well be my Lord Lord Justice Baker knows of more in the family jurisdiction, but I really did find very much, and, and the case I've referred to is Boyd and in Communities, 2013 EWCA Civ 756, which is at the authorities bundle at page 656, and that is tab 27. begins at paragraph 45 at the bottom of 671. And um, the court says, just above 46, there's no difference in principle between an unidentified witness and a witness who could be identified but gives evidence anonymously out of fear or for some other reason. Of course, the reasons for wishing to give evidence anonymously our careful scrutiny. Uh, and then, quoting from the Milkhouse case, which was another uh, possession case, uh, the court references Lord Justice Brooks saying, the willingness of a civil court to admit hearsay evidence carries with it an inherent dangers in a case like this. As Mr. McDonald said, rumours abound in a small housing estate, and it's much more difficult for a judge to assess the truth of what he's being told if the original maker's statement does not tend to be cross-examined on his or her evidence. Uh, and then 
really picking it up again at, at, at the paragraph below, a paragraph 136 of his judgment in Mauthaus, Brook LG observed that the large volume of hearsay evidence in that case presented the judge with an unusually difficult problem, and that might be better if he'd started his judgment with an analysis of the direct oral evidence which he received, and made more transparently clear his approach to the evidence of the absent named witness and anonymous witnesses. Uh, where are we going with, with this, your submissions on this? I mean, you don't deny that the evidence was admissible. It was absolutely admissible, and I don't think there's any dispute. The only question is, 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 was the judge's treatment of the weight to be attached to it wrong? Yes. yes. And the, the, you're coming on to that later on. I, I will not have come on to it very, I mean, very soon. But that's, that's right. It, it's, it's, <clears throat> there isn't a recognition in the judgment of the necessity of there being some caution about extensive anonymous evidence for the very, very obvious reasons that identification of who they are is not known, there's no ability to cross-examine well, them. Are you, are, you coming, are you dealing with that point now, or are you coming on to it? No, that's, that, I mean, that, that, that is just an outline of the submission. I'll come on to it very, very briefly. Um, well, what, are you coming to it now? Yeah, no, no, my lord. I'll You'll come on to it. it. Yes. Okay, well, I won't pick you up on it yet. <laughs> and also, I rely on paragraph 49 of, of, of Boyd uh, as, as well, which isn't marked up. Can I then turn to the to, to, to make my submissions with respect of the judgment? The, the, the judgment is at the core bundle at page 157. Sorry, I'm sorry, it, it's at uh, 105. So we can put away our authorities as far yes. as you're concerned now, can we? Lord, yes. And it's clear from paragraph 9 and 10 that the judge was proceeding on the basis that um, the, the, the injunction should be made on the basis of section 16 and not section 47. Paragraph 9 of the judgment. So for the reasons I've already advanced, we say that was the wrong test. And he should have proceeded on the basis of section 47, section 37, and the principal approach of just and convenient, rather than section 16.5 and expedient and best interests. He then goes on to say, paragraph 10, that he didn't have to deal with, uh, if in effect, the search for principal in the exercise of the section 37 matter, but he said if he did, then G had um, rights and equity. And that's uh, a paragraph 15. He then turns to paragraph 16 to deal with the question of the admissibility of the hearsay evidence. And, uh, and again, correctly apply section four of the Civil Evidence Act. And then goes on in, in the body of the judgment to quote extensively from that evidence, uh, the anonymized evidence. That there is not in judgment, in my submission, a best interest analysis in respect of those parts of the injunction that impose significant limitations on care and contact and trips into the community. Now, it said it was obvious that the judge was doing that, but what is missing is the application of the section four statutory test to consider whether all of those restrictions on care and contact in a straightforward way were in fact in G's best interests. And my submission is it cannot be easily read across just because the judge has decided in December that there must be discharge to the care home, that it follows that the judge was saying 
the significant restrictions on care and contact and trips were also in her best interests. And the application at the hearing in June was an application for an injunction, not an application for best interests, orders or decisions. In fact, there is no Section 16 decision imposing <coughs> the restrictions on care and contact. And the trips well, the best the interest decision, fundamental best interest decision, was that G, December. G should move to the care home. The Lord, yes. So that, and that best interest decision was a given on the basis, um, I'm not challenged on this, it was challenged by your client, it seems, but not formally. So this, all, this order was at, <coughs> all these orders were ancillary to that best interest decision. Yes, the, the, the judge made a clear section 16 decision to consent to G's discharge to the care home in December and then was asked to consider an application for an injunction. Yes, and the basis being that your client was impeding the decision implementation of the decision which the judge had made, the court had made in December. Yes. So these orders were, don't these orders fit in to the language of section 16, subject to your preliminary points? Don't they fit into the language as being necessary and expedient to give effect to that decision? Um, the, uh, again it goes back to the point I've already made, that the section 16.5 decision is still the best interest decision which section 4 applies, yeah. and there is no section 4 analysis which would be mandated by way of section 16.3 to arrive at those conclusions. And none of that was assumed at the December hearing. That's the way I put it, my lord. Section 16.3 does not permit a section 16.5 ancillary order to dispense with the statutory checklist in section 4. So time consuming I, I appreciate, but it was important for the judge when considering the injunction application to properly apply section 4 in arriving at the restrictions on <coughs> G's care and support and trips in the community. So, summarising the, the decision, we say the first error is, is, is going by section 16.5 and not section 47. The second error is not carrying out, as was required by section 16.3, the best interest analysis that the injunction seeks to give effect to. The third difficulty is the hearsay point, um, my lords, that the judge appreciates the considerations in section 4 of the Civil Evidence Act, but he gives insufficient weight and does not caution himself about how he deals with that evidence and concludes that very significant weight should be attached to it because there was no proper basis for the nursing staff to lie. And that is significant, my lords, because he was considering also, this is set out in the judgment, evidence that my client or other family members might have tampered with G's medical equipment. <coughs> now, it would have been right to consider those categories of evidence separately and distinctly to consider the need for anonymous evidence to protect nurses because of their concern about getting evidence about uh, abuse or intimidatory behaviour. But when the court is considering the much more significant issue of tampering, there's no division of separation or consideration of that. Now, the, the point that's made against me is, well, it's fine because the judge didn't make any findings. But in my submission, it is unfair for the trust to have introduced anonymous evidence of tampering. The judge then at the hearing was very concerned about it and then concluded he didn't have to make any findings. But still, there was this anonymous, highly prejudicial 
evidence introduced, which was unfair to my client, my lords. And that's, that's the error in respect of permitting weight to be attached to anonymous evidence, even if findings aren't made. It's highly prejudicial. Well, where do you say the judge attached weight? Can be shown to attach weight to the anonymous allegations or insinuations against your client of tampering with the. No, there, there is a reference which I'll just try uh, and find where he says the nurses would have no reason to lie, or words to that effect. <coughs> Thank you very much. 45. Um, in the middle it says, moreover, there's no rational, coherent reason as to why so many nurses should malevolently exaggerate or fabricate false evidence in the way that LF is driven to suggest. Well, is that about the tampering, alleged tampering? Um, it, it, but, my Lord, I, I, I read the judgment not to make any distinction between the different allegations that were made by the anonymous witnesses. Well, the alternative view is that at paragraph 38, he puts all of that evidence to one side. He, he makes a decision, my lord, not to make findings, but the plain language of paragraph 45 is he's not separating out the allegations of tampering for the reasons he gives them. Why would fabricated false evidence be provided? And, and my, my simple point, the Lord, is that's unfair. Well, if the your your client's case on the rest of the evidence, leaving aside the allegations of tampering, was that it was false. The evidence, the, the anonymous nurse's evidence, was all false. It's quite difficult for him to take a view on a lot of it because he didn't he didn't know who was making the allegations. Um, but yes, he denied acting in a consistent, rude, or abusive. Or so there's no there's no there's no necessity to read into the sentence beginning with the word moro moreover in paragraph five any implied reference to the allegations of tampering which the judge had set aside in paragraph 38. My lord, I, I, I intellectually uh, see the distinction that's being made, but the point is that the evidence was there before the judge, highly prejudicial and anonymous, and it's very difficult to say that this didn't have an, an influence on the approach that he took to the necessity of injunctions. Even if if one reads on in paragraph 45, Lord, yes. what persuades him to accept the evidence of the anonymous nurses excluding tampering is the consistent pattern he sees between that evidence and the wider forensic canvas. So if one reads 45 as a whole, doesn't it follow that He's not there dealing with the evidence of tampering, but rather with the other evidence of behavior where there is a consistency between the anonymous nurses and the evidence of Nurse T and Nurse and Dr. B, who were not anonymous. Well, I think that, that's, that, 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 that's, that's difficult because in the body of the judgment, all of the allegations, whether they're abusive behaviours or tampering, are traversed. And paragraph 45 is not limited in clear terms to the abusive behaviour allegations. And it is reasonable in my submission to conclude that the judge was considering all of the allegations when he said they had no reason to lie. And there is no there isn't a, 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 a part of the judgment in which one can say the judge recognised the dangers of the of, of so much anonymous evidence, and he was cautioning himself in respect of it. Well, I'm focused on the, the words that come after the sentence you're concerned about, Lord, in yes. paragraph 45, but it also applies to the words that come before it, in 45, doesn't it? The point I'm making: the evidential framework. 
pattern of behavior that he's talking about is a pattern of which he says is consistent. And Nurse T and Dr. B weren't talking about tampering, allegations of tampering, were they? Um, nurse, uh, I think T was, Nurse T was. In fact, uh, I, I cross-examined Nurse T on that issue. Um, Direct evidence that she had seen? Um, no, my lord, no. I think her, her answer in cross-examination, which I don't think is disputed by other parties, was she had no direct evidence of. So you cross-examined her about the allegations made by others? Yes. So uh, insofar uh, yes. as Nurse T evidence chimes with the other anonymous evidence, it's not in relation to the alleged tampering. Um, my Lord, I would simply say it, it's simply not clear from the judgment. That's really your, your point, yes. Is, is, that, is that there is, a, is, is that it's, it's not clear in paragraph 45 and open to yes. argument that he was still taking into account the intent. Yes. My Lord, that's Alleg right. Alle allegations. And that's particularly because he, he, the judge makes a decision not to make findings. But again, that's, that's on the basis because he wasn't being asked to by the trust. But he clearly had very significant concerns about it. But he had not approached the question of the weight to be attached to that evidence in the way that would be necessary to establish a fair hearing, my lord. All right. Does that deal with the judgment? My lord, yes. Can I just ask before we leave it? Because lord, I understand it. The four key points, though, are those set out at paragraph 20. Is that yeah. right? And those are key points. Um, those are the points that he then looks at what evidence supports. Um, those points. It wasn't quite that straightforward, my lord. Those were the points distilled in the position statement, but the evidence traversed the tamperings but they were not set out in the same way in the position statement. I think that's a fair summary of those that were at the hearing. As I, as I understand it, what, what the judge sets out those four points and then says B and D are established in evidence. Um, um, no, alter, no sensible alternative construction, but also LF's own eventual concession. Lord, yes. Etc. So that's... that's B and D, and then A um, is on the basis of uh, the statement of Nurse T amplified in her oral evidence, um, and C is correspondence. Lord, yes. So, as far as those four points are concerned, none of that is based upon the hearsay. Um, no, that's that's right. That's right, and and the worst, the worst. Concessions made by my client in cross examination, which the judge details. The, the findings that Mr. that my client had been creating an atmosphere of stress and general unhappiness and deep mistrust comes from comes partly from some of the direct oral evidence but also is largely supported by the anonymous evidence. And certainly the suggestion that there was a sustained attempt to intimidate and undermine in a way which mirrored his behaviours in the High Dependency Unit of paragraph 44, again, we would say that comes from the anonymous evidence and too much weight was uh, put on that evidence. Can I understand the, the way in which the, the evidence was, was put in? It was the anonymous evidence. Nurse T had set it out in a report. Yes. Um, what um, at my own understanding took place is that Nurse T emailed nurses and said, would you provide some background? And those emails are, or the responses to those emails are the documents in the supplementary bundle um, at tabs 24 to 32. So 24 to 31, 
So these are exhibited to Nurse T's well, statement, they, which they, got it, or were? Yes, no, they weren't, my lord. Um, what took place was they were summarised, they were, they were set out in the witness statement. At the hearing, I said, well, where's the underlying material? Didn't initially get it, and then the judge made an order, and it was provided on day three of the hearing. And I think it's fair to say that the material that was provided in the emails, which is set out there, is the same as what was set out in Nurse T's witness statement. Okay, so she... Okay. So, yeah, so this, was the, this was the raw material which yes. was okay. uh, uh, We didn't see her email requesting that information. Okay. But that, that, that's how it fits together. So you've got, so you've got the responses um, in, 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 in the nurse's own words. You just haven't got their identity. My lord, that's right. right. Uh, but it's, it's simply not just their... It, without knowing their identities, it's difficult for my client to respond because he doesn't know who's making the allegation, when the allegation relates to, or, or, or to challenge that in any meaningful way. And, and again, I think I put it in my skeleton argument, it's not being contradicted. When Nurse T was cross-examined by me, and I asked her to provide an example of this abuse or intimidating behavior, she only gave one example, which was a day in which G's tracheostomy was disconnected and not reconnected, which was a life-threatening event. The other nurse who attended and was cross-examined couldn't give any examples, specific examples, just said rude and intimidatory. Now, there has to be some particularization of these allegations so that my client could meaningfully be in a position to understand the case against him and challenge it or respond to it. Particularly so when highly prejudicial allegations are woven through that anonymous evidence on the much more serious issue of tampering and, and as I've already made my submission, the judge doesn't separate the different strands or issues and appears to suggest that all of the evidence would be true. But the idea that there would have been a, a parade of nurses going to the witness box to be cross-examined, is that, is that what you think should have happened? Lord, yes. Um, or, or, or certainly a number of them and I think it was anticipated by the trust that they would be available to be questioned, but they weren't because some of them were on night shifts. And that would have made good the uh, good some of their some of their fears, wouldn't it? It's certainly one of the one of the challenges. I mean, there's no doubt that, in, for example, um, your, your client, if you're, your client's in court, so, so Lord, yes. his own, I'm only giving a hypothetical example from other cases I've done involving uh, so called factitious illness, in which allegations are made of, a, of an adult tampering, of a, somebody tampering with a patient. You do get nurses coming to give evidence, but that is undoubtedly, the law says you get a parade of nurses. You do in some of those cases. Yes. That's why they take so long. Yes. Um, but it, are you saying that the judge could not have made the findings on the basis of his evidence, or only that the way in which he made the findings was unfair to your client? Or well, the way unsa he made unsafe. Yeah, it, 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 it's, uh, it's prejudicial and unsafe, my lord, to make some of the findings. As my lord, lord, lord Phillips has made clear, some of that flows from the documents or concessions made. Yeah, but. For example, at paragraphs 41 and 44, there are um, findings that he had been creating an atmosphere of stress and general unhappiness and deep mistrust on the HDU, and there was a sustained attempt to intimidate and undermine in a way which mirrored his behaviours in HDU. Those types of findings, which go, start, go to the heart of the grant of the injunction, were the types of allegations that would require some form of particularisation and questioning of identified witnesses and therefore too much weight was, was given to anonymous hearsay evidence and, and that we say is prejudicial and unfair. Right. Now are we, are we, where are we going now? The, the, the submissions, um, point area, area yes. five, is that right? No, that's right. Um, and some of this might be uh, repeating what I've said earlier, but can the judgment support the injunction? Um, that, that is the, 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 
the key uh, submission which I now deal with. Um, and, and we say it cannot. Um, the wrong test of an injunction was applied. Even if the judge proceeded on the basis that section 47 and 37 were correct, G does not have a right in equity which the judge was protecting. There was no, as is required by section 16.3, best interest analysis. And there was inappropriate or too much weight given to the anonymous evidence. All of those factors mean that this court cannot safely say if they'd been if those errors had not been made, that the injunction can be made by this court. We say the only the only proper way to determine the issue is for the matter to be remitted to hearing. In which the correct test is applied, there is a correct focus on making best interest decisions, and there's a proper consideration of what weight should properly be attached to the anonymous hearsay evidence. Mm. And, and all of those create considerable difficulties. This court saying, well, e even if it was uh, necessary to make the injunction pursuant to section 47 and 37 of the Supreme Court Act. This court can, can make it on the basis of the judgment that you have. We, we say that simply isn't possible, and that there is a requirement, given there are, I think, 30, I think Mr. Brownhill says it in his scalp number, there are 34 separate <coughs> prohibitions on a father and a mother and a grandmother. Uh, any of those, if breached, could lead to committal proceedings and the loss of their liberty. And it is important that they are entitled to have a hearing in which the correct tests are identified and then applied through appropriate evidence with the right way of being attached. Now that G has moved, the, um, does there have in any event to be a review of the scope of the injunction? And my lord, we, we would say yes. Um, the trust, I think, is no longer involved. Yes. Um, it's not clear which trust is leading on her care, I'm told, by my client. And there requires to be a review, um, in any event, of the extent of the injunction. The order simply said it would have effect for 12 months. Yes. Um, um, well, it, it covers, it does cover the care home, doesn't it? Yes, oh, absolutely, Miller. The, the restrictions on um, all three appellants apply with the same force to the staff at the care home, and the restrictions on visiting, contact, and trips all apply with the same force right. at the care so home. So it does, it does, the order doesn't. Of necessity, need to go back for review. Not on the terms of the order, but no. no. I, I have uh, prepared some more detailed submissions on the application of Section Thirty Seven to these proceedings. But what I might do is see to what extent. My lords require the respondents to deal with that to see if I've got anything to say to counter them. And um, rather than take up more time, I said I might be about an hour and a half, but I'm now coming up to two hours. Um, okay. I heard you down as two hours. Um, the Lord, yes, but I, I wanted to have at least some some time for a reply. Okay. Um, so the, the, the summary of our case is. Just that, before you. My Lord, yes. That, can I pick up a very small point? You, you, you said an answer to my lord. As to whether there has to be a review, the trust was no longer involved. I understand that. And then you said something which I've written down as not clear according to my client which trust is now involved. Can you explain that? Is, yes. Is any hospital trust now involved at all? Or is, my understanding is what used to be a CCG and yes. now called something else, Integrated Care Board. Integrated Care Board, my lord, yes. Has contracted with a 
the care home, which, which is a private institution, to provide accommodation and care. But to what extent is there any hospital trust involved at all? Uh, my understanding is there isn't a, a, a trust involved, is what I'm told, but there, there, there needs to be one. Because whilst the ICB is contracted with the care home to provide the care arrangements, there is a need for there to be a clinician who is experienced in long-term ventilation in the community to care for the tracheostomy, my lord. And that's provided through an NHS trust? Is it? Through an NHS trust. It would be, I think, because the previous trust was a paediatric trust, yes. and that needs to be an adult trust and an adult clinician with long-term ventilation experience. And your case is that has your client is unaware of Yes. Who's actually He's unaware and, in and charge so yes. far, or, or, or legally yes. responsible? Well, perhaps Mr. Malonis can help us with that. Yes, and, and is concerned because, I mean, this is I think disputed by the ICB, but is concerned about the quality and standard of care, and that's having an impact on a number of aspects of G's life. But I don't want to get into that in in any in any greater detail because I'm here to consider whether the injunction to yes. ask my lord to consider the injunction. I just have one very, not very course, minor point. In the judgment, paragraph 37. Um, 47. 37. 37, yes. The quotes from uh, Nurse T. Um, we have paragraph 16, 17. And then the next numbered paragraph is 19. And then he talks about 18. 18. Is it, is it I, I assumed it was the paragraph beginning. With during, the, during yeah. you just missed out the 18, but we've got, we've got the order. Um, I, I will check. Um, nurse T's witness statement to Which make sure that's correct. Then I sit down. We have it, um, but I, I probably don't want to take up time doing that now. But th that witness statement is at page one hundred and three of the supplementary bundle. And going very quickly. Yes. 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 Now paragraph eighteen is during. We'll G's put eighteen there. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Unless I can assist any further, Madam. Those are our. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Yes, now, Ms. Cohen, I think you're going next. Uh, my Lord, I'm grateful. I wonder if I could trouble uh, the learned friend, Mr. Malone, to call. Oh, ah, in fact, Mr. Kendrick has one of the little things for us. Yes, Ms. Cohen. Uh, thank you, my Lord. Forgive me, just for Just get yourself hour. sorted. Um, um, reorganise my. We're all, all labouring under lots of screens up here in the Master of the Rolls Court. Uh, yes, I am in, in, in an attempt to be technical, my lord, uh, and have everything at my fingertips. Well, take your take a moment. Well, uh, I'm very grateful, um, my lord. I I act for the mother, um, who I believe has been anonymised in these proceedings. Yes. Um, I shall attempt very hard not yeah. to um, transgress the provisions of the reporting restriction. <coughs> um, obviously, M supports. And I imagine, although I'm not stopping you, I imagine that you in, you you adopt Mr. McKendrick's analysis of the induction provisions, or do you want, do you, or by, don't you? By and large, my lord. By absolutely. And large. Absolutely. There, there are there are a few things I would wish to trouble the court very briefly on, no. but um, again, I. I no, would... Let me brief. We've got a we've got an hour. Yes. Uh, very briefly, there were a couple of points I wanted to raise on the. Section 47 provision. Um, looking at the statute, the reach is slightly more circumscribed in my submission than might otherwise appear. It's at page 23 of the authorities bundle. You have been taken to it before. In fact, page 20, it's 23 on the PDF. Um, and it says, the court has, in connection with its jurisdiction, the same powers, rights, privileges, and authority as the High Court. And of course, the Vice President in this case, notwithstanding that he could have sat as a judge of the High Court, was not so doing. He was sitting as the judge of the Court of Protection. Yeah. Although I note, notwithstanding uh, Lord Justice Mumby's frequent comments on the point, the order does still say in the High Court, does it? Court of Protection. When, course, the Court of Protection is not part of the High Court. It's not. It's no. Not. It's a separate court. It, indeed so, my Lord, and, and, and that's my point. That it is its own circumscribed jurisdiction. Well, what, is, what is the statute which establishes the Court of Protection in its modern form? Mental Capacity Act, Act, Section 45. 
establishes the mental capacity act. And it's something that, that Lord Justice Marbury mentions in frequently, I think it's in Reedy in the Court of Appeal, who says, notwithstanding that the Court of Protection has been in extant for 10 years, and still seeing orders which refer to the High Court. Um, it matters in, in these circumstances. I think I was on the receiving end of one of his comments about that <laughs> a, long, a long time ago, Ms. Cairn. Um, it's relevant in these circumstances because, of course, Section 47 is saying that the court has the authority of the High Court in connection with its jurisdiction. And we know from the Supreme Court case of N and a CCG, which you have in the authorities bundle, um, I don't know if I need to take you to it, um, but it's set out at, at paragraph 24 of that, uh, which is at... Um, this is the resources case. Yes, quite so. It's at tab 19. Um, and it says at, at, at paragraph 24... Let, let's, get, let's get it up. Tab 19. It's Lady Hale, isn't it? Yes, quite so, my lord. It's uh, paragraph 24, yeah. which is at page 477 of the bundle. And of course, this is a case, I, I know your lordship is very familiar with it. It's about uh, the wishes of parents to have their, their child provided the care with them yeah. in a certain way, and the statutory body saying refuses to fund it. Uh, and Lady Hale says, the jurisdiction of the Court of Protection, and for that matter, the inherent jurisdiction of the High Court relating to people who lack capacity, is limited to decisions the person is unable to take for himself. It's not equated to the wardship, it's not equated to the power of the children. Mm. Uh, this is relevant in my submission because in these circumstances, Section 47 is accordingly only playing a part in importing a, a, an injunction insofar as that is within the jurisdiction of the Court of Protection. And it's relevant also to look at the statutory provision of Section 37, which is in the bundle at page 22 and page 23. You see in section 31, 37 1, which is what we're all concerned with, the High Court may by order grant an injunction or appoint a receiver in all cases where it appears just and convenient. But it's also relevant to note in my submission, my lord, if you go on to 37 6, it says this section applies in relation to the Family Court as it applies in relation to the High Court. Now it might have said this section applies in relation to the Family Court and the Court of Protection, as it applies to the High Court, but it doesn't. It simply says, High Court has its power, Family Court. So that was added when the Family Court was, I'm guessing now, created. Yes, probably so. In 2013, in, 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 I think that's the act which, the Crime and Courts Act was the court that created the Family Court. Yes, and of course it, it I'm sure the point you're, 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 you're leading towards is that it, this predates, the MCA. No, um, uh, what pre <laughs> the the eighty one Act date. obviously does, yes. yes. And and it's amended to bring in into effect the fact that the family court exists. It hasn't been amended to reflect the fact that the court of protection exists. And it might have been. The relevance of this, my lord, is to reinforce the submissions made on behalf of the father on the mother's behalf, which is to say Section thirty seven of the Senior Courts Act is imported into the Court of Protection by Section 47, but only insofar as that is within the jurisdiction of the Court of Protection. Well, the wording is as in connection with the In connection with its jurisdiction. Um, and it would, have to, it would have to say that, wouldn't it? Otherwise, you'd find people to bring shipping cases <laughs> in the Court of Protection. Sorry, it sounds facetious, but... <laughs> what a horrible idea, that would be, but, <laughs> having to do a shipping case. But it's <laughs> obviously, it's not saying that the... Obviously, what it can't say is the Court of Protection has the same jurisdiction as the High Court. Yes. So it's saying it's only in connection, in connection with its jurisdiction. Yes, absolutely. Um, but it, but uh, do I understand what you're saying is that, that, that in, in some ways it's, it is limits the Section 37 power to um, the powers that it otherwise had under the Act. Yes. In which case, what does it add? I'm not sure that it adds anything per se, my Lord, save as it's 
demonstrates the circumscription of those powers. They are not all-encompassing. They are restricted to those decisions which he can make for himself and restricted to those orders that the court can make on P's behalf under Section 14. Are you saying there's a distinction between how the family court, well, the family court's powers and the court of protection's powers by reason of the way in which uh, it's subsection 6 been inserted? My Lord, I wouldn't want to transgress into the realm of the family court. That's not an area in which I practice. What I would say is that this is indicating that the section 37 power is brought into the court of protection, but with defined limits. And in those circumstances, it can be brought to bear in accordance with Section 37, but only insofar as the reach of the Court of Protection extends. I, I wonder if you are now departing from what Mr. McKenna was saying. I, I understand that he's effectively saying that there are two separate powers. There is 16.5, which has the necessary and necessary or expedient Speed. test. And then separately from that is section 47 and section 37, which has a different test of just convenience. And I understand the thrust of his appeal is the judge was wrong to use section 16.5 and the test there under, because that's limited to um, best interest requirements. Yes. He should have used section 37. Absolutely. But I understand you're now saying that effectively there is no <coughs> distinction because section 37 is prescribed by the powers under the, otherwise under the Act. If that's the impression I've given, then I, 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 I absolutely do not want to give that impression. What I'm saying simply, and I don't want to speak too highly, is that it is a prescribed jurisdiction all the powers need to be reviewed in those circumstances. Section 16 is its own uh, statutory provision, which goes to, as Mr. McKendrick has already covered, decisions made on P's behalf, which are limited, as in the N and the CCB Supreme Court case, to those decisions that P can make on his behalf. Section 47 of the Mental Capacity Act imports the power to injunct under Section 37 of the Senior Courts Act, but that is under the just and convenient test. It is not under the necessary. Yeah. I have perhaps confused things with what I thought was a rather a, a clever um, point on um, the uh, Section 47 6 um, provision, or Section 37 6 provision. So I, I'm not going to trouble the court any further on that because I can see I have any added complexity, whereas I wish to bring clarity. But if I could move on from that, uh, just to reinforce, not that I think they need it, the submissions made on behalf of the father by Mr. McKenna. We would support his appeal very clearly in terms of the fact that Section 16.5 is, is the narrow end of the funnel, as it were. The decision-making power comes in under Section, section 16.2, and it has its, its effect under Section 16.5. It does not broaden those powers. And I would reinforce the point that Mr. McKendrick made to say that it doesn't give you any greater power than you would have under Section 16.2 by Section 16.5. It is an, an ancillary power. Um, I think the one point where Ms. McKendrick and I have slightly diverged in our submissions is the extent to which he has read uh, Section 16.5 to refer only to deputies, but I don't think that that is something that he pursued particularly, and I would agree with the point that he made that this is not determinative uh, of the appeal um, in this instance. So how do you explain uh, Section 17.1c? Um, yeah. Well, I would, I would echo the submissions that, that, that Mr. McKendrick uh, made, having, having heard the responses from your lordship. In my submission, it is, a, it is a different area of decision making, which is that Section 17 is mostly confined, is confined rather, to those decisions he could make on his behalf. And, and, and I heard the points that, that Lord Justice Nugent made in terms of. Uh, a capacitous individual not necessarily being able to limit the contact that they had with the third party. But in my submission, it is still no 
nonetheless a decision that he could make for himself, albeit that he might need the enforcement of an outside agency to reinforce it, it is qualitatively different from, for example, the funding decision that, that was an issue in a CC and in the CCG, because that was not in his gift. Whereas in this instance, a decision not to have contact with, with for somebody not to have contact with you is in your gift, notwithstanding that you might need uh, the extraneous powers of the police, the court, to enforce it. I'm not having con a decision not to have contact is, is a B, isn't it? Yeah. And C, it may be order to prohibit a named person from having contact with the police. In my submission, that is qualitatively different from a decision which lies entirely out with his uh, decision-making power, i.e., you know, uh, what, what um, statutory provision might be made available to him which a uh, public body doesn't give to funds. But the decision that I, I, I would not want people to speak to my nurses or speak to the care home or interfere with my placement, that's also something that, that he could, he had capacity, could, could decide. Well, he could say, I could say to my parent, I don't want you to do X, Y, and Z, but I, I couldn't stop them. It's not, it's not my power that is an issue. It's, it's theirs. It's their right. But that's, the same with, that's the same with 171C, isn't it? Well, in my submission, it's not, because it's, it's contact with Keyes. It's not contact with a third party. And, and I would suggest that in those circumstances, it is different. But, but this is prohibiting a named person, that's the third party. Yes, but with P. It, it, is, it is still within P's uh, grasp to make that decision. Is it? I mean, this is repeating a point I put to Mr. McKendry. But if I'm a capacitous individual and I've fallen out with my parent, or more likely with an ex partner, and I say, please don't write to me, if you send me any letters, I will return them unlikely. I don't want you to send them to me. And they bombard me with 25 letters a day. What can I do about it? <coughs> Apart from taking proceedings. But I can't stop them sending me letters. No, but, but, but you personally could take proceedings to stop them. Whereas there is a qualitative difference in my submission between me taking proceedings to prevent a third party from having communication with me versus preventing a third party having communication with a and other. Right, so that's, that's, that, that's you, that isn't covered by 17 C. No. <coughs> but it is, but 17 is not, the categories of order met under 17 are not mm. closed. Is no. It, it says in particular, doesn't it? It's, uh, yes, it says in particular. It's in particular, yeah, so, so yeah. 17 is not closed. And 16.5, broad enough to include orders preventing your client from speaking to nursing staff. Isn't it? Isn't it? As it, if, the, if the decision is that G should move to the care home, yeah. and, the, and the, 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 the evidence established that your client was impeding that in a variety of ways, including by speaking to mm. medical staff in the hospital. Why wouldn't the terms of 15.5 prevent the court making an order stopping her doing that? If the court considered that it was necessary and expedient to do that, to give effect to the decision that G should go to the care home. Because in my submission, it is limited to decisions made on Key's behalf. And that's why it says, Section 16.5, the final clause, order and appointment made by it under subsection 2. My note, that's not right. I, uh, sorry. No, no. The, if, the, 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 the phrase on P's behalf does not appear in 5. At the end, the court may make such further orders or give such directions to confer on a deputy such powers or imposing him such duties as it thinks necessary or expedient for giving effect to or otherwise in connection with an order or appointment made by it under Yeah, so the order, the order and the decision under 2, 16.2, yes. and this may be oversimplifying it, but 
influence the argument. The decision, the principal decision was, G is going to the care home. Indeed, that's what prompted all this anyway. That's why they made the application, because it was said the appellants were all, into, were all uh, seeking to impede that. So what the court is doing here is making an, order, an ancillary order necessary to give effect to the decision on P's behalf. If in so far as, as that analysis is, is, is correct, my submission is that that is, is, is not borne out by the statute, which gives the power to make an order in support of Section 16.2 decision. So uh, the court may make an order on people behalf in relation to a matter of matters. I decide that she's going to go home. So you can make some decisions under Section 16.5 that would enable that, but they cannot go beyond that into the scope of an injunction because that is not provided for within the terms of the Act, which is strictly provided for by the Senior Courts Act 1981. And in circumstances where there is no reference to an injunction on the face of the Act, in my submission, it would be contrary to ordinary statutory interpretive principles to redefine it by reading it into Section 16. But we know it includes 17.1c. And that's got to be an injunction. Well, it says 17.1c on the face of the Act, but it doesn't say anything further than that. But in any event, I would re revert that's to my previous submission, my Lord, which is that 17.1c remains a decision that P could make for himself. Or well, that it might need bolstering. Well, I think you said that P could bring proceedings himself. Yes, but it's still a decision that is open yes. to P. But whereas if a decision. But he could, he could bring proceedings to stop somebody interfering with his place. Or her placement. Yes. So I'm not sure why it's any different. Well, they are categories, they are different categories, my Lord, of decisions. Best interest decisions with regard to where you might live or the care you might receive are open under Section 16. Section 17 specifically refers to an order prohibiting contact. That is one specific element under Section 17.1c. I, I, I heard my Lordship's observation that, of course, those um, uh, provisions are not closed under Section 17. Yeah. But it does not broaden the reach of Section 16.2, in my submission, to include, to include all those decisions which are out with P's decision-making powers. You mean 16.2 or 16.5? I mean 16.2, 16 because in my submission, you only have the power under se Section 16.2. Section, Section 16.5 is ancillary orders which bring that into effect. But they don't broaden the scope of Section 16.2, which is very clearly limited by the Supreme Court. Some of the orders which are under appeal are orders that P can make, are, are decisions that P of capacitors can make for himself. For example, I don't want you to give me personal care. Mm -hmm. that, that's yes. a, that, no, no, I, I, I fully, accept, fully accept that. Does that mean that those parts of the order were made under Section 16.5? My Lord, no. They would still be made under Section 16.2, they were decisions. And then in my submission, the court ought properly to have imported the power under Section 37 of the Senior Courts Act through Section 47 to give injunctive relief. So the court can decide under Section 16 that it's in P's best interest that care be given by X and not by Y. If it wants to make an ancillary order saying Y should be prohibited from giving care to P with a penal notice attached, it can't do it under Section 16.5, but it has to do it under Section 47. Is that your submission? Okay. Well, I, I circumstances has to apply the just and convenient test rather than the necessary or expedient. Yes. Can I ask you something else? Which is, we know because we've got it in the core bundle that Mr. Justice Hayden 
made the decision in December that it was in P's best interest to be discharged to the care home. Do we have the order consequent upon that judgment? I, I don't think we do, my Lord, and I should clarify that I'm sure you've picked this up, but of course my client wasn't represented in those proceedings. No. She wasn't a part of that stage. Okay. Is, but presumably we can have the order to which my Lord's just referred over the short adjournment. Thank you. Kendrick. Yes? Um, I don't know if I need to trouble the court further on the section 16 point. You've heard a great deal from Mr. McKendrick, which I'm sure was more illuminating than anything that I could add. No, it's been um, very illuminating. Uh, in terms of um, one point, which was, was and, and again, I hesitate to trans transgress into areas of chancery law. Um, uh, he says with a heavy heart. Um, but, but, but your lordship brought up uh, the case of Broad Idea, yes. um, which of course is the Ladies Privy Council case on, on the breach of injunctions. And of course, as, as your lordship also acknowledged, uh, as Sir Geoffrey Voss observed in that case, it is the comments of Lord Le Leggett are over to her, although I wouldn't want to suggest, of course, anything uh, other than that they remain persuasive in these circumstances. But in, in my submission, um, notwithstanding that the broad idea case, and of course that's Do we, uh, should we get it? Should we look at it? Yes. Uh, so this is. Um, it's, it's at tab 20, page okay. 4. So this is broad idea in the Privy Council. Privy Council. It's Privy Council. And Lord Leggett. I don't know whether he'd agree to be called Chancery. Forgive me, my Lord. He, uh, I was, uh, you, you were saying you didn't want to trespass into Chancery matters, and I. Well, Leggett, well, Leggett is now trans is in, is in everything, as the Lord points out. But so, paragraph ninety, isn't it? It's it. Well, well, that's that's the point at which um, uh, Sir Geoffrey Vaughan refers to it being um, overture. Um, so it, that observation by the Master of the Rolls was in the subsequent case, was it? No, it's in my no, no, it's dissenting. In oh, the dissent. Of course, yes, yes, yes. yes. One seven four. Um, I think, I think the appeal is actually from the BVI, but, but yes. the, the, the substantive claim was proceeding in Hong Kong. Yes, and it's pursuing, um, it's pursuing assets, which I believe are in Hong Kong at this point. Um, but the, the, the relevant element in my submission begins at uh, paragraph 22 of the judgment.
go through the subsequent decision of Orion LaRue, uh, <coughs> principles and practices that have, ar have arisen. But the point is, and he says it, it's at paragraph 52, I finally got there. Thank you for bearing with me, uh, your, lords, your lordships. He says, proposition asserted by Lord Diplock in the Siskino and Brain and Vulcan on the authority of the North London Railway was that an injunction may only be granted to protect a legal or equitable right. There can be no ob objection to this proposition insofar as it signifies the need to identify an interest of the claimant which merits protection and a legal or equitable principle which justifies exercising the power to grant an injunction to protect that interest by ordering the defendant to do or refrain from doing something. Now, the reason I've taken you rather laboriously to that point is, and, and this, is, this is something that I've pursued that, that I don't think Mr. Kendrick has pursued necessarily on behalf of the father, which is, if and insofar as, as our case succeeds, that it should be section 37 and section 47 rather than section 16.5, the just and convenient test requires the identification, as Lord Leggett affirms, of a legal or equitable right which requires enforcement, which, which has a right of enforcement. And in my submission in this case, G, the young woman with whom we, we are concerned, has no such relevant right because notwithstanding that the proceedings for an injunction were brought um, purportedly to ensure her move from the hospital to the care home, the fact remained that the decision for her to move to the care home was in the gift of A, the CCD as ponder and B, the care home as to whether it wished to have her. And at any point, notwithstanding the grant of the injunction, or the best interest decision of Mr Justice Hayden in December, the care home could have, could have, and in fact nearly did say, thank you very much, we don't want this patient anymore, we don't have room, we don't have people, whatever. The CCG might equally have said, we're not prepared to fund this anymore. And, and there is nothing that the Court of Protection could have done to enforce any nominal right that G may have had. But I don't... I don't quite understand the thrust of that submission. Mm. Undoubtedly, in December, what the Court of Protection was doing was making a decision on behalf of P, who was incapacitated, of the type of decision that she would have been able to make if incapacitated, namely, where should I live? And that's expressly identified in Section 17. It's one of the things you can do under Section 16. She could decide, and therefore, if capacitous, and therefore the court could decide for her, would I rather go and live with my parents or would I rather go and live in a care home? And that was a decision the court made using the best interest test. Now, I don't understand you to say that wasn't a decision the court couldn't make. I mean, that, that was a perfectly valid decision. Nobody's appealed that. Nobody suggested the court couldn't do that. Or that the court incorrectly applied the calculus in Section 4 and identifying what was in her best interest. I know that the father doesn't accept the decision. Um, uh, and I don't know what your client's position is. But, but for our purposes today, that is a, a proper decision made by the court in the best interests of, of G. Absolutely. Why is it then relevant that actually that's not entirely within her gift because the care home could say we're withdrawing the offer or the ICB could say we're no longer prepared to fund it. That neither of those things has happened and she has moved there. So, so why is it relevant that those things might have happened? I don't, I don't see how that assists in the analysis. It's relevant, my lord, in terms of the necessity and the justification for the grant of the injunction, which in my submission should have been applying the just and convenient test. And in my submission, in the absence of an enforceable decision, because I, 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 I don't disagree at all, of course, that the Vice President had made the decision in her best interest, those facts notwithstanding, it is, it is not a decision that could have been enforced if any party decided it was no longer something that they wished to offer in terms of the funder. So, so your point is, looking at Lord Leggett's way in which he expresses himself 
paragraph 52, she doesn't have an interest which merits protection. Is so that, when you put it like that, my lady, it doesn't it, sound very it doesn't sound, That's what he <laughs> says at 52. He <laughs> says, Lord Diplock said you need legal electoral rights. He said, I'm, I'm happy with that as long as, as long as you, by that you mean you have to identify some legitimate interest of the claimant, which merits pr the protection of the court, and a principle which justifies exercising the court's injunctive powers. Now, the interest of the, in this case, the patient, G, is to move to where the court has decided it's in her best interest to move to. She has, that's a legitimate interest. And, and if she were capacitors, she would do everything she could to persuade the care home and the ICB to, to fund it and to keep the offer open. <coughs> and why is the court not able to do what it can to persuade the care home to keep the offer open, including stopping people from disrupting the placement by writing abusive letters to the care home suggesting they're not competent? Well, first of all, I'd like to put a, a pin, as they say, in, in, in the suggestion that there was any evidence against my client. I understand, that, 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 that's, that's a separate suggestion. point. We're yeah, dealing, with, we're dealing with the jurisdiction yeah. of the court. To, to, yes, and I recognise Lord Leggett is saying we can't have these narrowly defined circumstances in which you, you, you can grant an injunction and that, that it, the limits haven't been defined. Where there is an equitable right that needs protection, the court can step in. But in my submission, there have to be limits to the power, particularly of a circumscribed jurisdiction such as the Court of, of Protection, to step in with injunctive relief to support any best interest decision that it may have made. Now, the best interest decision made in December was that G should move to a care home with exactly the same care and involvement of her parents. And I can take you to it if, if necessary, but Justice Hayden talks in those terms about the, the involvement of the parents and the hope that it will remain. That's a decision that's made in December. The injunction is brought on completely different terms, explicitly different terms, which severely limits the involvement of the parents. In my submission, that is a different decision. And if and insofar as, as, as you are saying, the court has the power to preserve its decision from December, by making further orders, well, of course, I, I would agree with that up to a point. It cannot mean that the court, having made the best interest decision in December, is then armed with any, any power it so wishes to bring that decision to bear. Because that, that would mean, for example, if the care home had said, we'll have her here, but only if you, you grant an order that no member of the family come within 100 miles of the care home. It might be expedient in terms of having the, the placement uh, reserved, but it's not necessary to, uh, to support the interest that she has, if and insofar as she has one. And in my submission, it wouldn't be just. And you, you can't say that simply because the court made a decision, a best interest decision in December, it's thereafter armed with all the decision, the, all the case management powers it might choose to enforce that decision. There are limits to what the court can do. There are limits to which it control the, can control the actions of third parties simply because they do things that it might not like. And it, it's a point made, made in the old case of, of um, Day and Brown Rig, where they talk, it's the, the case with the two houses where the annoying neighbour has taken on the, on the name of the house. Uh, I'll, I'll pull it up very briefly. It's, uh, it's a court of appeal case, Day and Brown Rig. It's at, it, it's at um, 21 in the bundle. Uh, but in that case, there are two neighbours, and one of them, General Brown Rig, has started calling his name, his house, Ashford Lodge, the same as this next door neighbour's house. And it's obviously really irritating and foolish and unnecessary. And so an, an injunction is granted against him at first instance. But Lord Justice James says, and it's at page 563 of the bundle, appears to me there's no damage alleged, there's no legal right alleged, the violation of which was the cause of the damage 
That being said, it's not for this court to say that because somebody is doing something which it thinks not quite right, something which ought not to be done by one person to another, it should interfere. In my submission, there has to be a, a, a more stringent <coughs> test than saying there is something that we think is not quite right. Ergo, we are going to put penal notices on an order, transgression of which will result in you going to prison. And in my submission, in this case, that test hasn't been met. It hasn't been properly applied. Can I just ask you, uh, just to go back to the question of what right is engaged in here? Um, I understand your point that you say that the offer could be withdrawn by the care home and the, the relevant authorities could cease to be prepared to fund it. I understand that. But for so long as the offer was open and funded, and does not uh, G have a right to accept it. He does have a right to accept it. Yes, and that I must be an that. But that must be a legal or ec equitable right. If, if 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 we were to accept that for the sake of argument, it would it would still mean the importation of the just and necessary test, uh, just and convenient test, which in my submission would be met in this case. It doesn't seem to me it's any different, although, although, although we obviously are in a particularly particular context here. I mean, any offer of um, any offer to a person of provide a service, um, if third party try to interfere with that relationship, the, the acceptance of an offer, whether it is contractual. That would be classically the type of behaviour which the courts would injunct, whether it's regarded as an interference with business or interfering with contractual relations or whatever. And, it, and for my part, I don't see any difficulty at all in saying that we had the right to move to the care home for so long as the offer was open, and that anyone who is seeking to interfere with that can properly be injunct whether it's under section 16.5 or under section 37 or both. I don't, at the moment I'm struggling to see why that is a controversial position. My difficulty with that, my lord, is that it would be simple to say there are a number of authorities that I think it's the official solicitor relies on, their inherent jurisdiction authorities who are not entirely on point, <coughs> in which inductive powers of the court are brought to bear. There's one case, it's the Israeli case, the HHS, because the family of E have directly acted in contravention of, of the Section 16 decision. So the court has made a decision, he will remain in care home and they have removed E from the jurisdiction of the Israel. In those circumstances, you can, you can see there is, there is a clear interference with the decision made by the court. The court has the power to stop it. Okay, I accept that. If it's, in my submission, it is a different uh, intellectual exercise to extrapolate from that all of these behaviours which a third party doesn't like become instrumental in subverting the decision of the court. Ergo, they must all be stopped. Because that's the not a matter of jurisdiction, is it? It's, um, th th that's a question of the judge having to assess the evidence to yeah. see whether that, that um, behaviour is subverting and, pre uh, and preventing the offer being accepted. In my submission, it's both, because you don't come within the jurisdiction unless you are explicitly, I would submit, going against the order of the court. The order of the court in, in December wasn't about any of the behaviours in issue. The order was about where she should move. And, and I would accept if there had already been an order saying, she will move, you will change your behaviours to X, uh, Visiting will be Y, correspondence will be Z, and then there was a transgression of that. There would be a different set of arguments in play now. But there aren't. The decision in December was simply that she would move to a particular placement. I, I think there are also uh, decisions made about ceilings of care. Well, Mr. McKenna is going to, uh, or oh, oh, his solicitor is going to arrange for us to see a copy of that. Yeah. I think we'll break now, uh, Ms. Kern. Resume at, um, we've got to start resume at five past two.